My next speaker today is Emily Adler. Emily received her PhD in relativistic quantum information, actually, at the University of Cambridge in 2017. Uh, then Emily has left academia for four years, and is that right? I hope it's right. Uh, and then since 2021, um, you've been a postdoc at the Rodman Institute of Philosophy at Western University in London, Ontario. So you're a physicist and philosopher. I'm not sure if you subscribe to one of these two more than the other. <laughs> in any case, I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, and you tell us about the question whether science needs intersubjectivity and the problem of confirmation in orthodox interpretations of quantum mechanics. Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. Um, so today, today I'm interested in talking about what one might refer to as the, the first person interpretations of quantum mechanics, also sometimes known as the orthodox interpretations. Um, and what I want to do today is, is argue against those interpretations, because I think all of these interpretations share a pretty serious problem, which makes them unsustainable as ways of thinking about quantum mechanics. Um, so in particular, my concern is going to be that these interpretations make it impossible to ground the idea that we have into subjectivity, that we can share facts with other observers. Uh, and that's a problem because the epistemology of science, and particularly uh, the process of empirical confirmation, relies very crucially on the notion that we can have intersubjectivity and that we can share facts about the world with other observers. Uh, so it would seem that these interpretations of quantum mechanics tell us that quantum mechanics itself can't be empirically confirmed. Uh, but of course, the only reason to believe in some interpretation of quantum mechanics is because you think uh, quantum mechanics itself is true. Um, and so if these interpretations tell us that quantum mechanics can't be empirically confirmed, they are undermining themselves and therefore it can't be rational to think about quantum mechanics in this way. Uh, so I'm going to begin by uh, being more specific about the class of interpretations that I'm concerned with here. Uh, I'm then going to talk about how shared facts and intersubjectivity work in these interpretations and argue that indeed they can't support shared facts. Uh, I'm then going to give two major reasons why it's really important to have shared facts in an interpretation of quantum mechanics. First, because it, it's crucial in the context of these kinds of interpretations to know something about the contents of other perspectives. Uh, and second, because it's certainly crucial to, at the very least, uh, have access to memories and records of the past which tell us something meaningful about the past, uh, and we can't have that without at least some minimal notion of shared facts or, or intersubjectivity. Uh, I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about how we can update these interpretations to allow having shared facts. And it will turn out that there is a way to do so, uh, but we can only do that by making them less first person and by uh, allowing that there is a notion of sort of third person standpoint on reality. Uh, so I'm concerned here with the class of orthodox interpretations, also sometimes known as Copenhagenish interpretations. So these interpre interpretations have three crucial properties. Uh, first off, they tell us that relative to every observer, each measurement has a unique outcome with the probabilities for the outcome being given by the Born rule. So in particular, that rules out things like the Everett interpretation, where it, every, every measurement has uh, a range of different interpretations for the same observer, and we end up with different copies of the same observer seeing different things. Uh, second, these approaches tell us that quantum mechanics is universal and complete. So nothing needs to be added to quantum mechanics, uh, to unitary quantum mechanics. There are no wave function collapses. There's no additional classical ontology or classical particles. There are no classical trajectories or anything like that. Um, so these, these first two properties uh, might look concerning because there's a sense in which they seem to be in tension with each other. Uh, so in particular, uh, if we think about a Wigner's friend type experiment, uh, there seems to be a, an issue if we say that unitary quantum mechanics is uh, universal and complete for both Wigner and his friend, uh, because the friend will experience himself as seeing a unique measurement outcome to the measurement that he makes. But at the same time, the friend, will, the uh, Wigner will continue to describe the friend unitarily uh, and will therefore think that the friend is in a position of two outcomes and can, there can still be interference experiments performed on him to see interference between those two branches. So how do we reconcile those two properties? Well, the orthodox interpretations reconcile these properties by telling us that quantum mechanics does not describe an observer-independent external reality. In fact, what quantum mechanics describes is something like a set of perspectives. Um, 
and all these these approaches have slightly different you know ways of cashing out what the set of perspectives looks like and justifying what what picture of reality they give but the, the basic idea in all these cases is that we shouldn't try to make third person statements about reality uh, all meaningful statements are relative to the perspective of an observer and that is that so this class of interpretations includes some versions of the Copenhagen interpretations, uh, some versions of uh, neo-Copenhagen interpretations, some versions of cubism, some pragmatic interpretations, and some versions of relational quantum mechanics. Uh, so the reason I qualify all those statements is because uh, I'm not concerned about these interpretations uh, insofar as they're regarded as being kind of good enough for now, but you know, there probably is some observer independent reality out there which we, we might have to learn about. Uh, I'm specifically concerned about these interpretations insofar as they're regarded as making a strong novel claim about their reality. Insofar as they're regarded as telling us that reality, it, that, that there are no observer independent facts at all, or that uh, any observer independent facts that there are are ineff ineffable and unknowable. Uh, so um, if the interpretation is just regarded as saying there, there is an observer independent reality out there which we don't yet know about, that is fine. But I would say in that case, then all this talk about quantum mechanics being a sort of first person theory is really a distraction from the real issue, which is to understand what exactly needs to be added to quantum mechanics to make sense of this and to give us a, a sensible intersubject subject of reality. Uh, so in that sense, regardless of whether the, the interpretations are regarded as uh, fine for now or you know, making the strong claim that there is no observer independent reality, uh, either way, I think all this talk about quantum mechanics as a first person theory uh, needs to be put aside and, and moved to, to the bigger question of how to make sense of uh, the intersubject of, intersubject of reality. So focusing now on these orthodox interpretations, which tell us that there are no observer independent facts, I want to ask a question about how shared facts work in this kind of scenario. Uh, so in particular, let's imagine the following situation. We have two observers, Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice measures some system S in some basis V, obtaining a measurement outcome MFA. Uh, and Bob also measures the same system in the same basis, obtaining a measurement outcome MSB. And finally, Bob performs a measurement on Alice herself, uh, which is supposed to establish for Bob uh, information about what Alice saw in her measurement, uh, obtaining a measurement outcome MAB. So that measurement could just be an interaction in which Bob asks Alice, hey, what did you get in your measurement? Uh, Alice tells him her, her result, uh, and that result, that, that thing that she tells him is the result of his measurement on her. So the question we now have to pose is, what is the relation between these three measurement outcomes, MSA, MSB, and MAB? Uh, so first of all, we can say quite straightforwardly that all the orthodox interpretations must tell us that MSB equals MAB. That is, that is to say, uh, the results of Bob's two measurement outcomes must match. That's because we saw earlier that the orthodox interpretations tell us that quantum mechanics is universal and complete. And that means that when Bob uh, observes Alice performing her measurement, he must describe Alice as becoming entangled with the system that she has measured, uh, which means that when uh, Bob measures the system and then he measures Alice, his results must match in exactly the way we'd, we would expect from a measurement on any kind of entangled system. So the orthodox interpretations all tell us that in this situation and other similar situations, observers like Bob will always have internally consistent descriptions. All the things that they learn will, will present to them an internally consistent perspective and description of the world uh, where they won't see any confusing things, where uh, they won't end up seeing confusing cases where, for example, they get one measurement result and then Alice reports getting a totally different measurement result. Everything will seem to make sense from the first person perspective. Uh, but internally consistent descriptions applies only within a given perspective, so that still leaves a further fact about what is the relation between the perspective of Bob and the perspective of Alice in this scenario. So what is the relation between uh, MSA and MAB? Um, so it seems quite natural to think that, that the result of Bob's measurement should match the result of Alice's measurement, right? Bob asks Alice what measurement result she got. She tells him that presum presumably what he hears in that interaction should uh, match up to what Alice thinks she's told him, which will in turn match up with what result she actually got in her measurement. Uh, but 
uh, orthodox interpretations of quantum mechanics don't seem to say that's true, uh, because the, the whole point of an orthodox interpretation is that all facts are relative to a perspective. Uh, and that means there's no automatic matching between what Bob hears Alice saying in this interaction and what Alice thinks she has said. Uh, the orthodox interpretations don't seem to say that Bob, Bob will necessarily hear something that has any systematic relation to what Alice thinks she said. Uh, and therefore, uh, we, the orthodox interpretations don't seem to give us any particular reason to think that, in fact, what Bob learns about what Alice, Alice uh, has experienced has any particular relation to what Alice has actually experienced. Uh, and indeed, this argument shows quite clearly that the orthodox interpretations cannot tell us that there are any shared facts in this situation. So first off, we note that the orthodox interpretations tell us that there are no observer independent facts about events which can be described quantum mechanically. Moreover, the orthodox interpretations also tell us that quantum mechanics is universal, uh, and that means that there are no observer independent facts about any events, including macroscopic events like Alice trying to tell Bob about the result of her measurement. Uh, so that means that uh, we can't just assume that there's relations between perspectives based on uh, observer independent facts which ground those relations. Uh, instead, if we want shared facts to be reliably true, we, we're going to need to explicitly provide some structure which actually coordinates perspectives and coordinates measurement outcomes for different observers in the way specified by shared facts. Moreover, it's pretty straightforward to see that unitary quantum mechanics doesn't provide any such structure. Uh, that's because unitary quantum mechanics doesn't have a wave function collapse. It doesn't have any mechanism to single out a particular unique measurement outcome, even for any one observer. And therefore, it certainly doesn't tell us anything about the relations between the unique measurement outcomes obtained by different observers. Uh, unitary quantum mechanics is just totally silent on that question. Uh, so we can't get that structure from unitary quantum mechanics. Moreover, kind of the founding principle of the orthodox interpretations is that unitary quantum mechanics is complete and nothing needs to be added to it. So, so the orthodox interpretation can't step in and add some structure to coordinate outcomes in the way required by shared facts because they are very insistent that quantum mechanics is already fine the way it is. So what that, that leads straightforwardly to the conclusion that the orthodox interpretations can't have any structure to coordinate measurement outcomes in this way. And so they just can't tell us that shared facts is reliably true. So there are a number of different responses that the proponents of orthodox interpretations uh, make to this kind of concern. Um, one approach is just is to, to simply insist that shared facts is true anyway. So for example, here we have Kathleen Bruckner telling us that it seems as though perhaps we should have shared facts in this context of an orthodox interpretation, even though there doesn't seem to be any particular anything in the series saying that that is true. Um, and these kind of assertions, I think, are just grounded on the intuition that we kind of expect that shared facts should be true. It seems as though they should be true. And, and, and I agree that that is a, re, a reasonable intuition and something that, something, something that we would like to demand of our theories. Um, but this does not follow from an orthodox interpretation. It doesn't make sense to, to simply assert that your orthodox interpretation has this consequence. If you want this to be true in the context of your orthodox interpretation, you need to provide some argument or some reasoning which explains how this comes to be true, because the intuitions that we have about shared facts just don't hold up in a context where there are no observer independent facts to begin with. Um, other proponents of orthodox interpretations have, have sort of suggested that something to do with decoherence might solve this problem. Uh, I don't know how exactly this is supposed to work, um, but it's pretty straightforward to see that decoherence can't solve this problem because decoherence is a feature of unitary quantum mechanics, which applies within a given perspective, uh, within the, the unitary quantum mechanics as described from the perspective of a single observer. So decoherence is very important in this context uh, because it will help to make sure that each individual observer ends up with a perspective that contains a kind of quasi-classical stable reality, which of course is, is important for the orthodox interpretations. But decoherence says nothing at all about how different perspectives are related to each other. Uh, so again, decoherence on its own can't really help. Um, another reaction that, that, we, that proponents of the, these interpretations will sometimes make is to say, well, your question is illegitimate. You shouldn't ask questions about how the perspectives of Bob and Ellis are related to each other. There is no third-person standpoint. Those questions are totally meaningless and can't even be posed. 
Um, and indeed, I, I entirely agree that in the context of an orthodox interpretation, it's meaningless to, to ask or answer questions about the relations between different perspectives. But that is precisely the problem that I'm trying to raise. Uh, as I'm about to explain, science relies really crucially on the idea that we do have shared facts and that we can compare our perspectives to other uh, and thus, if the orthodox interpretations won't even allow us to ask questions about those relations, uh, they can't be compatible with scientific rationality, and therefore they can't be regarded as viable options as an interpretation of a scientific theory. Now, some uh, proponents of orthodox interpretations more or less accept that, that, that there are no shared facts in their interpretations and seem fairly blasé about this fact. Uh, the reasoning here seems to be something like, well, we know quantum mechanics is pretty weird. Any interpretation of quantum mechanics is going to have to have some kind of weirdness weirdness in it. And the absence of intersubjectivity is just our chosen form of weirdness, you know, end of story. Uh, now this approach I think doesn't really hold up um, it, because I think it's important to make a distinction between two different types of weirdness. Uh, so there are some interpretations of quantum mechanics which are weird in the sense that they're a bit counterintuitive. They tell us that the world is a bit different from the way we might naturally think it is. Um, but they don't raise epistemic problems. They don't undermine scientific confirmation or scientific rationality. Uh, so I would argue that things like locality and contextuality go into that box. Sure, they seem a bit weird, but they don't raise any severe epistemic problems. Uh, then there's another type of weirdness. Uh, for things that are not just counterintuitive, but which severely disrupt our usual beliefs about the relationship between observers and the evidence that we use for scientific theories. Uh, and those types of weirdness are, are much more dangerous because they uh, threaten to undermine the epistemic status of quantum mechanics as an empirically confirmed theory. Uh, and thus, if your interpretation has that kind of weirdness, there's a real onus on you to provide an explanation about of how quantum mechanics can possibly be empirically confirmed, even though uh, our relationship with our evidence is very different to the way that we thought it was when we first arrived at quantum mechanics. And I would put into that box uh, both the many world hypothesis as, as in the Everett interpretation, and also the lack of intersubjectivity that orthodox interpretations have. Uh, so, so I now want to give you two reasons reasons why um, uh, intersubjectivity is really important in, in uh, for scientific confirmation, and why it's particularly important in the context of the orthodox interpretations. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to go over this. If, you, if, you have a, if you're interested, you can look at the paper for some more technical details about how exactly this impacts uh, uh, scientific confirmation from a sort of a Bayesian epistemology standpoint. Um, but here I'll just give kind of the high level summary. So we need, we need shared facts and we need intersubjectivity to do scientific confirmation because science requires us to use reports from other observers, right? The empirical confirmation attached to quantum mechanics doesn't just come from a set of experiments that I myself have performed. The reason we have so much faith in empirical quantum mechanics is because we have received reports from a whole bunch of different observers across, uh, across the world and at different times and places who report uh, obtaining very similar results. Uh, all of these observers report seeing results in, which are consistent with quantum mechanics. And thus our belief in quantum mechanics, our belief that has been empirically confirmed, relies on our belief that when we listen to reports from other observers, um, what we hear is telling us something meaningful about what those observers actually observed. Um, and as we saw in the Ellison Bob case, uh, in, the, in an orthodox interpretation, we just can't rely on that. Uh, what Alice tell, thinks she's tell, told Bob could be totally different from what Bob experiences Alex, Alice is saying, and therefore observers in that kind of, a kind of uh, situation just can't rely on reports for other observers as a reliable way of learning about what's going on in the world and as a reliable way of confirming scientific theories. So that severely undermines the empirical confirmation that is supposed to be attached to quantum mechanics. Um, now, I might respond to this by noting that, of course, even in classical cases, reports from, from other observers are not totally reliable. Uh, it, other observers can lie to us, there can be miscommunications, you know, things can go wrong in the process of communication. Uh, but nonetheless, in a sort of ordinary take on classical physics, where we assume that there's some observer independent third person reality that we're all communicating within, uh, we are allowed to suppose that in, in the ideal case where everything goes right and everyone is being honest, when we communicate with each other, we achieve communication. We end up with some shared facts, uh, which just, uh, we end up knowing about what other people have experienced. Um, 
Whereas in an orthodox interpretation, there is there's just no circumstances under which we can, we can have that view. There are no circumstances in which we can co feel confident that what we have heard from the report from another observer has anything to do with what the other observer actually observed. But furthermore, intersubjectivity and accessing other perspectives is actually much more important in the context of an orthodox interpretation uh, than in the context of, a, of an interpretation where quantum mechanics is regarded as telling us about a third person external reality. Because if my aim in confirming quantum mechanics is to learn something about third person external reality, ultimately all I need to, all I need to, to believe is that uh, my observations are giving me reliable information about that third person external reality. I don't really need to worry about what other observers are experiencing. Uh, because if I do enough enough, uh, enough experiments, I can at least, I can still learn about the third person external reality, regardless of what other people experience. But the orthodox interpretations tell us that there is no third person external reality and quantum mechanics is about nothing more than perspectives, the contents of various perspectives. And that means that if I want to empirically confirm quantum mechanics, the one kind of information that I really need is information about what is going on inside various people's perspectives, because that is what the theory is supposed to be about. And yet that seems to be that exactly the kind of information that orthodox interpretations tell us we cannot have. We cannot access anybody else's perspective. We're stuck within our own perspective, uh, limited to our, our own view on the world. So we have only a single data point um, about what, what a single perspective is like. And that just isn't, is, doesn't give us grounds to confirm, empirically confirm a scientific theory, which is supposed to be a theory about perspectives and about uh, how not just my perspective, but you know, all perspectives interface with the world and what kind of, uh, what kind of experiences they have. So orthodox interpretations seem to explicitly forbid us from having the one kind of information we would really need to confirm quantum mechanics if indeed their take on quantum mechanics is, is correct. So one possible route for the proponents of orthodox interpretations would be to kind of accept all this and say, well, I'm going to take a step back from the claim that uh, quantum mechanics describes all perspectives. And I'm just going to say that regard quantum mechanics as, as the theory which correctly describes one perspective. Um, I can empirically confirm that quantum mechanics is a correct description of my own perspective on the world. And then maybe I can kind of kind of make some assumption to the effect that because I'm not special, I'm not unique, presumably other, other observers have similar perspectives, and thus I can maybe infer that quantum mechanics describes other perspectives too. Uh, and that route might work if it were possible to, to uh, arrive at empirical confirmation of quantum mechanics as a description of my own perspective. Um, but if we don't have shared facts, it's not even possible to do that. Uh, because if I want to, to, to confirm that quantum mechanics is a correct description of my own perspective on the world, I need to be able to consult memories and records uh, and rely and, and, and have good reason to believe that those memories and records are systematically related to what past versions of myself actually experienced when I performed the relevant experiments. Uh, and that, that to, for that to be true in an orthodox interpretation, it's necessary to say that an observer doesn't exist just at a single moment in time. We would need to be able to say that an observer persists over time and has the same set of relative facts uh, at each point in time. Uh, the reason we need that is because, as we've seen, uh, orthodox interpretations don't give us any shared facts. And so I can't assume that I, that I have shared facts with past versions of myself if those past versions of myself are to be understood as different observers from me. I re I'm really going to have to insist that the past versions of myself are the same observer and have the same sort of relative facts uh, throughout my lifetime. So in order to make this work, orthodox interpretations are going to have to give us some grounds for kind of tracking the same observer over time and saying that, no, this really is the same observer at each moment of time. So they're going to need some well-defined precise criteria of personal identity, which allow us to identify that same observer over time. Uh, and the problem of tracking the personal identity of an agent over time is, is, a, is, a, is a lot very old philosophical problem. Uh, we don't really have time to go into the details right now, but it's quite well recognized that it doesn't seem to be any, any very well, well defined way of doing this. There's no objective criterion for deciding when two agents are the same. Um, you know, as agents are as, as agents that continue to exist, the physical stuff that, that they're made up of gets replaced, um, memories get lost. Uh, there's this kind of some degree of continuity between versions of the same agent, but there's no sort of precise criterion which says, yes, this is definitely the same agent. 
So if Cubists want to, want to insist that agents really do persist over time in a strong sense and maintain the same persist same perspective throughout their lifetime, it seems like the only only option to do that is to postulate something like a disembodied soul, which is supposed to sort of be attached to an agent and track the agent through time throughout its lifetime, so that we know which agents are supposed to share the same relative facts at different points in, the, in their lifetime. So to me, as, as a physicalist, as a scientist, being forced to postulate a disembodied soul seems pretty worrying uh, as the, the claim that quantum, the empirical confirmation of quantum mechanics relies on the existence of a disembodied soul looks like it's not the kind of thing that, sci that science should have to rely on. Uh, furthermore, a, a, as I've noted several times, it's kind of a crucial point for the orthodox interpretations that quantum mechanics is already complete and nothing needs to be added to it. And that means the orthodox interpretations don't really have the option of adding a disembodied soul that quantum mechanics is not complete. In order to make sense of it, we have to add at least some kind of disembodied soul to track agents over time. So that doesn't really look like an option uh, for the orthodox interpretation. Uh, and we could go through all the various orthodox interpretations and see what they say about agents and see if they have a reasonable way to track agents over time. I'll just give one example here. Um, cubism will normally tell us that what it is to be an observer is to be a decision theoretic agent whose beliefs are regulated by a principle of coherence. But the principle of coherence uh, does not apply across time, right? The principle of coherence, as usually understood, uh, applies to the beliefs of an agent at a single time. It doesn't allow us to make comparisons between observers at different times. And thus, agents uh, conceptualized in the cubist way, it seems as though they can't possibly persist across time. Uh, so. It seems, it seems as though in that context, agents can only ever have access to the contents of their perspective at a single time. And that single data point is not going to be enough information to confirm anything, uh, even to confirm quantum mechanics, even as a description of a single perspective. You would need at least a few more data points to say, oh, this continues to be a sensible description of this perspective uh, over, over the course of different observations rather than just in this one observation. Uh, another possible route one might take here would be to, to do basically what RQM does and say that uh, observers are really fundamental particles. Each particle counts as a different observer. There is a description of the world relative to it, every individual observer. Uh, and then we can, we can sort of make sense of the idea of observers persisting over time because we can track uh, a particle over time. We can see it, that it has a continuous trajectory and that allows us to identify the same observer at different times. Uh, so this is already a little bit dodgy because we know that in at least some regimes of quantum field theory, there aren't well-defined particles and trajectories. Uh, so, it, so even this criterion won't always allow us to track observers over time. But putting aside that problem, there's a bigger problem, which is that the whole point of orthodox interpretations is that we need to be able to say that individual human observers uh, will see unique outcomes to measurements. That's kind of the, the reason that they are orthodox interpretations and not uh, the Everett interpretation. Uh, but we've seen that we don't have shared facts between observers. So if a human observer is really made up of a, out, out of the uh, thousands of tiny individual particles, each of which count as a different observer, and if we have no reason to think those those individual particles share any facts, it seems impossible to understand how an individual human perspective in which a single outcome is, is observed could possibly arise from this picture. So in, in fact, the orthodox interpretations don't really have the option of insisting that all observers are fundamental particles that we can easily track. They do need to say that a human human being counts as an observer, in which case we have all the have we'll go back to the same problem of how do we track what counts as the same observer at different times. So it seems like there, there is in an orthodox interpretation, there isn't even really a way to confirm quantum mechanics as a theory of what describes a single perspective, because we're all stuck not only within our own perspective, but within a single moment in that own that perspective. And that anything at all. So is there anything we can do to solve this problem? Uh, I think that there is. Uh, and so Professor Relvelli and I recently wrote, wrote a paper where we propose a fairly simple solution uh, in the case of relational quantum mechanics to allow observers to have intersubjectivity. Um, and this is, this is a very simple postulate indeed, uh, somewhat ad hoc, but it does at least give an idea of what kind of thing would be needed to make an orthodox interpretation work. Uh, so basically our, I, our postulate perspective links, basically just says that in the, in the scenario we described earlier with Alice and Bob measuring the physical system, there are indeed shared facts. So that is to say, if Bob measures Alice in a, a basis which appropriately corresponds to her measurement result, 
And if uh, there has been no disturbance to Alice's physical variables in between her measurement and her measurement, then then we can can rely then it will reliably be the case that Bob's measurement result actually matches Alice's measurement result, and thus after this interaction, the observers share some facts about what uh, about the variables of the system F, uh, and therefore we're no longer stuck in our own perspectives. Now, adding shared facts and cross-perspective links in this way means that as observers interact, they, they can be expected to build up a kind of shared intersubjective reality composed of the facts that they share as a result of their interactions. And so we get a kind of emergent third-person description of the world, which is built up by the interactions between these various observers. Um, so th this postulates you know, I, I would like to see a bit more work done on this postulate. I'd like to see it on, on a slightly more well-founded physical uh, physical uh, description of reality. I particularly like more details about what exactly is the nature of the variable of Alice that Bob is supposed to measure to get this information. But this does at least show us that there is what, what an orthodox interpretation would have to do to make it susceptible to empirical confirmation. Um, and the key point I want to make about this postulate is that once you add this postulate to your orthodox interpretation, you don't have an orthodox interpretation anymore. Um, first off, it, we can no longer say that unitary quantum mechanics is complete and universal because we've acknowledged that something must be added to quantum mechanics. Some kind of, of structure coordinating perspectives has to be added. This structure is not there in unitary quantum mechanics. It's something else entirely. And so we are acknowledging with this, with this postulate that unitary quantum mechanics is not complete. Uh, Second, um, as I said, because these observers are interacting in this way, they are building up, up a set of, of shared facts. And so it's no longer the case in these sorts of uh, interpretations that all facts are relative to an observer. We now have a set of observer independent facts. First off, off there are facts about, about the relationships between different perspectives and whether they, they agree or don't agree. And second, there are the, the, the set of uh, shared facts that is built up by the, this network of observers. So we, we now have this kind of shared observer in the reality. Um, so inevitably, uh, in the attempt to make orthodox interpretations be subject to empirical confirmation, uh, what we end up with is a view which is no longer purely a, a first-person view. We have to end up invoking some kind of third-person intersubjective reality. Uh, without that, we just can't uh, regard quantum mechanics as being empirically confirmed. Uh, so in my opinion, this is a really interesting route to explore, right? It's leading us to, to, towards a realist view, a view where there is a third person external reality, but in quite a different way. Uh, this third person real, re, reality isn't just kind of presupposed, it, it comes into being via the interactions of agents and the way in which they share, share information. So this, I think, is, is really interesting and, and it deserves to be fully explored and uh, rather than just kind of hidden between the veneer of an orthodox interpretation. So what I like to see is rather than just insisting that quantum mechanics is, un is universal and complete, I think we need to acknowledge that quantum mechanics does need something to be added, and it would be nice to understand better the consequences of this. Um, so that, that's pretty much it, but I want to finish by making, making a sort of higher level point about realism and the postulation of a third person external reality, uh, because Proponents of these third per first person views often accuse those who believe in a third person external reality of sort of being overly attached to a naive classical view of the world uh, and just being unable to let go of those naive classical ideas. I mean, what this talk has, has shown, I hope, is that uh, postulating a third person external reality is not just about being overly attached to a naive classical picture of the world. We need an, an, a third person external reality to ground scientific rationality, to ground the practice of scientific empirical confirmation in science. And so there are very good scientific reasons for believing in some kind of third person external reality. Uh, and, and I hope that ra rather than sort of arguing about that, we can kind of come together to understand what that third person reality needs to look like, because uh, the, I think the orthodox the proponents of these first person interpretations are correct to observe that uh, perhaps we're making too strong assumptions about what this third person external reality looks like. It might be quite different to uh, our naive classical ideas about it, uh, but some such thing is needed. And so the, the really crucial task for interpreting quantum mechanics is to understand what the third person external reality is like in, is like in the context of quantum mechanics. Uh, so I guess I will, I will stop there and see if anyone has any comments to make. Great. Uh, thanks, Emily, for this fantastic talk. Um, yeah, let me first ask the other speakers if they want to jump in and comment. Ah, two hands raised. Who was first? 
Um, maybe let's this time start with Daniele. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to understand a little bit more, a little bit better what you discussed at the very end. So, your cross perspective links uh, seems to have the purpose of est of establishing, uh, you know, shared facts. Uh, but this seems to me even more than intersubjectivity in a sense, because uh, I, I would imagine that uh, all thing that is strictly needed is that uh, I can translate from my perspective to yours, uh, even okay. though the terms in the statements uh, actually change. So there's nothing, strictly speaking, independence of the, pers of the perspective, but we can simply communicate without losing uh, elements of our own uh, description of things so that's the first point and the other is uh, you know the starting point of, of this of the uh, identification of these links seems to be basically assuming that uh, the two uh, observers uh, first of all uh, are dealing with exactly the same system in the same state although at different times which i would imagine requires that uh, they have some way of first of all communicating that they have the same state so uh, to some extent, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, I mean, if, if uh, probably I'm not understanding, but uh, I would, I, 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 it would seem to me that it almost begs the question. Uh, so somehow you have to assume that there is a way to uh, agree exactly on what the state of the system is before you can actually establish such uh, links uh, for the results of measurements. And, 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 and in addition to this, it seems that you have to assume that basically nothing happens to the to the system when there is an interaction with the, with an, with one observer, so that the second observer can actually interact again with the system, and obtaining, as you said, exactly the same result because the system was exactly in the same state as before. This seems to me very very strong uh, assumptions. Yeah, so. Uh, when I described the sort of the cross perspective links, links situation, I described both Ellis and Bob measuring the same system. But that was just a presentational device um, that was to ask about what is the relation between these three uh, these these three observations. But the actual formulation of cross perspective links doesn't say it doesn't require Bob to measure the system at all. It doesn't say anything about two two agents both measuring the same system. It simply says that if Ellis measures the system and then Bob measures Ellis. Uh, the result of Bob's measurement on Alice gives him reliable information about what Alice saw when she measured that system. Uh, so the, the point of the third measurement was just to kind of make this, make, to, to compare uh, the postulate of internally consistent descriptions with the postulate of shared facts and see that those are two different things which don't, uh, don't necessarily translate to each other. Um, your, your first concern was that uh, in order to have intersubjectivity, we don't need to have exactly the same reality. We just have, need to have, you know, reliable reliable sort of translation between our perspectives. And again, I think that's entirely true. That's exactly what cross-perspective links delivers. It, it delivers the, the assurance that there are systematic relations between what Bob's, Bob uh, sees in his measurements on Alice and what Alice herself um, has experienced. It doesn't necessarily require that they are having subjectively the same experience or that things seem the same to them. It just, it just tells us that there is now a sort of reliable systematic map between those two perspectives. So yeah, I agree. We still, we, things are still quite for, for, quite first person in the sense that everyone has their own perspective. It's just that now there are reliable maps between those perspectives, and the existence of those maps is a third person fact. The fact that there are relations between perspectives is a it is itself an observer independent fact. So in that sense, we do need some observer independent facts, although each person can still have their own perspective, which is quite uh, unique and subjective to them. Thank you. Okay, great. Maybe you have um, um, Jacques next, because you mentioned cubism specifically, so I want to give Jacques an opportunity to respond. Thanks for that very interesting talk, Emily. And while listening to it, and while listening to it, um, it occurred to me that that at least you and I, I think, agree on on many points. For example, I, I do agree with you. And I want to say I don't necessarily speak for all cubists. Um, just to be clear, I'm, I'm going in my own direction here. But I agree with you that it is important to articulate something like third person point of view and uh, 
and intersubjectivity is very much um, a task for cubism. I think where we disagree is as to whether that's possible and how to do that. And you made a, a pretty forceful argument that cubism cannot do it in, in any reasonable way. But I, I think the way out is to understand what we mean by third person point of view. The way that you put it was in terms of uh, facts independently of agents. And the way that cubism would like to do it is to talk about facts invariant among agents. And I think this is a point that Daniele Tambeng also was um, talking about. And uh, so my first comment is that perhaps that provides a way, an escape from, from your logical argumentative structure. Um, but an additional comment has to do with this, the, the accusation that you made against cubism, that the only way for us to describe a continuous identity of an agent is through, I think you said something like an immortal soul. And Carlo Rovelli is, is, has previously uh, you know, express that he thinks cubism implies belief in immortal souls. Um, but I think that here, this this is probably because you're coming from, you, you said yourself, as, as a physicalist and a scientist. And I, I agree that from a physicalist point of view, where everything is matter, ultimately, the only place to talk about conscious experience and perception would have to be to introduce it as an additional element, something like an immortal soul. Um, so I think it is really important for cubism to move forward on this, to not adopt a physicalist point of view, that we, we have to be open to other options. Um, and if we do that, then we may have other avenues for defining continuous identity over time. I, I won't say that it will be trivial, but perhaps we could do something that's more palatable than invoking immortal souls. Yeah, so I, I think we're in agreement on a lot of this. Um, yeah, I have no, I have no objection to a view of cubism like the one you pre presented, where you know, there is some some reality out there, some ontology which we're trying to find out about. Uh, I just think that if if that is the claim, then all this first person talk is kind of a distraction from the real problem, which is to understand that reality. So I'm, I'm not sure that I find that all the talk about quantum mechanics as being purely first person and just a tool to be particularly useful if, once it's acknowledged that there is an external reality which grounds how quantum mechanics work works. Um, and similarly, I would say that you know, the, the difference between there being observer independent facts and there being uh, facts which are invariant between observers is, is just linguistic. If a fact which is invariant between observers is a fact. It is, is an observer independent fact. The fact that uh, there is some relation between perspectives is an observer independent fact. It's a relational fact which is true independent of any one observer. Um, so yeah, I don't think we terribly disagree there. With regard to the emotional soul point, um, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of approaches which require us to treat pre consciousness as kind of fundamental in that way. Um, I, I can see roots to doing that, but I would argue that if if there is if that is what is being done, uh, then cubes and can't claim can't claim to be one of those approaches which tell, tells us that quantum mechanics in and of itself is unitar is universal and complete, because that, that's acknowledging that something must be added. You know this. This persistent consciousness is not there in quantum mechanics. That's something which the cubist is bringing to the table. That's an addition they're making. It's not the addition that I would choose to make, but it is is one possible way of, of kind of rounding up quantum mechanics to give uh, a, a rational picture of reality. Um, but by doing that, and there is an acknowledgement that quantum mechanics in and of itself is not enough. So thanks again, Emily, for the great talk.